Good evening, members. Welcome to yet another <clears throat> of our continuing education lecture. Today, we'll be having Dr. Manana present to us on the common pitfalls in wisdom teeth surgery. I'm sure most of us know Dr. Manana, but for those who don't know him, I'll just give a brief introduction of who he is. He did his Bachelor of Dental Surgery at the University of Zimbabwe. Then he went on to do further studies in implantology and head and neck oncology and microvascular reconstructive surgery. He's a full-time lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, Department of Dentistry, and he also does philanthropic work, mainly in cleft surgery. Welcome, Dr. Manana, you can start your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vicky, for the introduction. Um, so today we want to look at wisdom teeth, or what I would call third molar surgeon, and some of the pitfalls that we, we come across every day in our practice. Huh? So what I would want to call 101 disasters from the masters. Huh? I believe the fact that we are a registered dentist, we are masters somehow, but uh, in practice, in one way or the other, we meet challenges and complications. Huh? And I would like to highlight some of these challenges huh? because there are so many, and wisdom, third molar surgery is a very broad uh, field. Huh? Um, so we are going to cover this in, in about three sessions. So this is part one of 101 disasters from, from the masters. Huh? Um, so just to, 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 to kickstart the presentation, um, the, the outline, will, I will start by defining a few terms and look at the etiology um, of impactions, a bit of epidemiology looking at international figures and how we classify these Im impacted wisdom teeth. We we'll also get to look at the indications, contraindications for disimpaction, and then we'll go straight into the procedure. So most of the disasters, they okay in the in either intraoperative or postoperatively. Um, I will not dwell so much in the in the outline. So as a way of laying foundation to these disasters, uh, um, what is an impacted tooth? So the word impacted, it comes from the Latin word impactus, uh, which basically means an, an organ or extraction, which because of abnormal mechanical condition has been prevented from assuming its normal position. Uh. So therefore an impacted tooth is a tooth which is completely or partially unerupted huh? and is positioned against another tooth, bone or soft tissues. Huh? So that its further eruption is highly unlikely. Huh? So the image that you are seeing up there is an image. This is a CT scan. So what you are seeing here is the orbiter and there is a wisdom tooth which is ectopic and impacted and positioned on the floor of the orbiter. So in such a patient, if you do the standard intra oral periapical x-rays, you, you will not be able to see the tooth. And the patient will present with pain and uh, you do, as I said, your IOPA and uh, you, you will miss the diagnosis. And the, that is a very common disaster. And one of these days, the patient will suddenly present with loss of the bone on the anterior wall of the maxilla and the draining sinus or fistula. I, I will demonstrate some of these cases as, as we proceed. And what is a disaster? You see, a disaster is it's, it's variable from person to person. What I might consider a disaster, maybe to you, is. It's, it's, it's normal. For example, that image of an implant, I'm sure the, the practitioner would look at it and say it's not a disaster, but uh, to me, I think it's a disaster. And what you are seeing is an image of uh, maybe during extraction of your upper wisdom tooth, you accidentally end up doing a max electomy, yet the intention was to do third molar surgery. 
So a disaster is an accident or a natural catastrophe that can cause damage or loss of life. Fortunately, most of the disasters in, in dentistry, they do not result in loss of life, but perhaps just a disability or imagine if you extract the, the wrong wisdom to that, the only complaint is I've lost my tooth. Um, but you notice that in disaster management or disaster risk management, it's a cycle. It has no beginning, it has no end. So whenever a disaster occurs, which is where we are starting today, we, we need to respond to the disaster. And how do we respond? We respond by, so every complication in dentistry, we need to be aware of how to, to solve or handle the complication. And once if we handle the complication in the immediate uh, period, we then proceed to rehabilitate or help the patient to recover. And uh, next time we then learn how to prevent or mitigate such circumstances and we'll be prepared when it happens. Uh, but preparedness does not mean that you never have another disaster. The more we practice, the longer we practice, we will realize that disaster will be knocking at our doors. Huh? So for those of you who watch football, you realize that there is a guy called Cortino who plays for Barcelona. You notice that last season, he didn't have many injuries, huh? unlike the previous seasons. Huh? But a closer look, you realize that most of the times you are seated on the bench because you, are, you wasn't playing. So you realize that the complications occur to people who are practicing and doing more procedures. So as you encounter these disasters, my encouragement is it's not an excuse to shy away from some of these procedures because you will not grow in the scope of your practice. And uh, again, as an introduction, you realize that impactions, the, they, are, they can okay for any tooth, be it a maxillary incisor, mandibular incisor, premolar. But by and large, if we rank them in terms of frequency, you notice that the mandibular molars is actually three, it's, it's the most common, commonly impacted tooth. Uh, three times more than the maxillary molar, which is ranked number two, uh, and then followed by canines and so forth and so forth. Uh. Um, so the, the least uh, commonly impacted tooth is the, the first molar because uh, it has no succeeding deciduous tooth. Uh, so its eruption pathway face, you normally would face less resistance. Uh. But this image is an example of a, an impacted six. This patient, I actually saw them today. So the, the, the causes, are, the main factors that would predispose patients to impactions are issues to do with insufficient dental arch space, issues to do with even an ectopically positioned tooth gemma during development or maybe the eruptive pathway is issues. Huh? Sometimes existence of um, certain pathologies that can obstruct the pathway of, of eruption. Huh? So this image is a, is a patient with multiple impacted teeth. Some of them are, so this is a CPCT, some of the teeth are palatally displaced as you can see. Huh? And uh, there are many theories of, of impactions. Huh? So the, the, the orthodontist would say that it has to do with, a, so the jaws develop a, in a downward and forward direction and the growth of the jaw and movement occurs in a forward direction. So anything that would then interfere with the, the, the growth of the jaws and would result in an impaction. Then there's also the phylogenic theory. Um, where by nature tries to eliminate the disused organs. Huh? So a more functional masticatory forces or better development of the jaws. Huh? So the more we chew, 
uh, we sort of stimulate growth of the joan. So this is actually almost in tandem with what is called the functional matrix theory, where uh, use would sort of stimulate uh, the growth of the alveolar process of, of the mandibular. So therefore, anything that affects a usage of the jaw. So you realize, for example, patients with TMJ ankylosis in childhood, they, they cannot open their mouth, they cannot chew, and their jaws or the mandible, for example, do not grow. And TMJ ankylosis is, is so much associated with impacted teeth. So pathological theory like uh, tumors, uh, ameloblastomas, all those things uh, can actually obstruct uh, the eruptive pathway of teeth. Uh. The Mendelian theory, we also think that there is a hereditary uh, component uh, and there are also endocrine diseases, uh, uh, what we would call the endocrine theory of, of, of impaction. Uh, so if a patient would ask you, what caused my impaction, you would then, uh, I know most of us, we are quick to say your jaw is small, but please note that there are other factors at, at play. Huh? It could be endocrine diseases. Huh? So in, in a nutshell, we are saying that there are local causes of, of impactions and there are systemic causes of impactions. And the local causes, we are looking at things like mechanical obstruction, for example, if you look at uh, that lesion, uh, a radio opacity uh, in the ramus of the mandible extending to the body, obstructing the eruptive pathway, the eruption pathway of the sixa. Sometimes issues to do with lack of space, root ankylosis, either due to trauma or whatever reason, non-absorbing or over-retained teeth. So we are talking about impactions in, in general, regardless of whether it's a wisdom tooth or a canine, uh, an ectopic tooth, but dilaceration of roots. Dilaceration is just a root cavity, uh, either at the tip or midway uh, in the root length, uh, soft tissue or bone lesions. Uh, so this would also qualify as a bone lesions. Uh. So commonly we have odontomas, uh, or dontomas, which can be uh, complex or compound. So the big ones, uh, like this, for example, would qualify as a complex odontoma. And typically, they have a radiolucence rim around the lesion, which you, uh, you would think that the lesion is trying to imitate the PDL space of a natural tooth, uh, because this is an abnormal uh, tooth-like structure. Uh, um, so systemic disease, there is a long list like thyroid disease, parathyroid disease, uh, pituitary adenomas. Uh, so you, you notice that the pituitary uh, thyroid adrenal axis, and it, it, it regulates the growth system in the body. And uh, by default, the growth of the jaws is, is, is affected. Uh, um, cleft patients and so forth and so forth. Huh? And uh, a bit of epidemiology, it's, it's very interesting that impactions are more common in females uh, compared to male. And they, there is an issue of race uh, where uh, if you go to Asians, huh, it's, it's more common, uh, uh, most probably because of their, uh, uh, they are small in terms of their physical profile compared to Caucasians. Uh, uh, and the, the, the Africans, it's, it's, it's less common. Uh. It is, and also, if you look at the, the, the eruption of the wisdom to the, the age at eruption, it's, it's very variable. So most the literature would say the range is between 15 to 25 years of age uh, with the uh, in certain countries, for example, if you go to West Africa, you notice the eruption is, is as early as 13 to 14 years. If you go to, to Europe, it can delay even up to 26 years. Huh? Then what happens for impacted teeth beyond the, 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 the age of, of 26? Is the tooth still erupting or it, it's st suddenly stuck? Huh? 
you know, from time to time, I get patients who ask me, my tooth is, is impacted huh? and it looks vertical. Is it going to, to come out at some point? Huh? So the, the answer to that is it depends on how much bone cover, but if there is no bone cover, there is some degree of, of eruption in every tooth, which is why, for example, if you do a lower wisdom tooth, you end up with supra eruption of an upper wisdom tooth. Huh? So there is an inherent the ability for, for migration in all teeth. So the migration is in, an, in a vertical direction, erupting uh, downwards for the upper tooth and also towards the midline, which is why the dental sockets get smaller with, with, with age. Um, so there are a few studies in terms of epidemiology. A very good one is in Singapore where they looked at 1,000 OPGs. Huh? So it's, it's very sad that in, in Zimbabwe, we don't have any literature with regard to, 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 to epidemiology of wisdom teeth. Huh? So these guys were looking at patients between 20 to 40 years of age. So what they realized is up to uh, close to 70% of the OPGs showed some degree of impaction and uh, uh, the mandible uh, uh, was three times more affected compared to, to the maxilla. And uh, uh, obviously, as I said, females are more affected. And the most common impaction was the mesioangular. And 80% um, of all impacted uh, third molars were partially buried. Huh? Now, this, this is very important. You realize that some impacted teeth are very deep inside the jaw. Uh, but I must mention that most of the wisdom teeth that we come across are, are close to the, to the surface, or at least there is a tip of the tooth that you are able to, to see. Uh. And it's, it's, it's paradoxical that the ones that are deeply embedded, they have a less tendency to become symptomatic. And the ones, the closer to the surface a wisdom tooth is, the more likely it will become symptomatic. Why? Because of, obviously, because of the interaction between the enamel and the oral flora or the bacteria and the issues to do with hygiene. Um, so uh, going a bit deeper with, with epidemiology, you will notice that some up to 30% of the uh, wisdom teeth can actually be missing. Huh? Uh, and another study on 500 army recruits found, found that up to 10,767 wisdom teeth were impacted. So for 5,000 people, we are looking at 20,000 wisdom teeth because we are applying by four, assuming that none is missing. And up to 10,000 of them, which is slightly above 50% were impacted. And the frequency of impacted lower wisdom teeth was as high as 70%. So this is a, a very common problem. Uh, and uh, the, the, the third molar, which is free of disease or symptoms, uh, you only get that in maybe 11 to 29%. And the percentage drops as the patient advances in age. So the instance of wisdom teeth removal uh, in, in England, for example, is four per 1,000 uh, patients. Uh, uh, prior to the guidelines uh, of, of 2000, uh, the, the NICE, I will talk about the 2000 NICE guidelines. I'm sure some of you are wondering what that is. Uh. And the, the, the classification of wisdom teeth, there are many classifications. So you can even come up with your own, but the, 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 the commonest classifications, they date back is in the 1920s. So we have the classification for mandibular wisdom teeth, the classification for maxillary wisdom teeth, and the classification that is used by dental insurance, particularly in Zimbabwe. So the Winters classification, Pearl and Gregory, 
So the one in that is used by medical aids is they say that wisdom teeth are either soft tissue impactions. I think they also say partially bone impaction or fully bone because they are trying to assess the, the degree of difficulty of, of, of doing the, the wisdom tooth. Huh? But then one wonders if a wisdom tooth is in the orbit huh? or in the uterus, huh? what tariff are we going to, to use for that particular wisdom tooth? Huh? And the classification, um, as I said, the, the commonest is the winters classification and the Pearl and Gregory classification. And uh, so the, 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 the winter's classification, it, it looks as to whether it's a vertical, mesial angular, horizontal, distal angular, buccal ang angular, lingual angular, inverted. Yeah. So that's what we are seeing down there. And the Pearl Gregory, it, it looks at the level and the class. So what do we mean by level? So the level is in reference to the, the second molar. So if the tooth is at the same occlusal plane with the second molar, so if the wisdom tooth is at the same occlusal plane with the second molar or slightly above, it's, it's classified as level A. If it is a, a around the cervical margin, just above the cervical margin, but below the occlusal plane, somewhere in between is classified as level B. And then if it is uh, below the cervical uh, margin, then it will be classified as level C. Class one is in reference to the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. So this line, so if the tooth is so it's in reference to the ramus and the distal margin of the second molar. So if the tooth is, uh, be, if it is between the distal margin of second molar and the ramus without any coverage, it's class one. So class two would be uh, part of half of the tooth is covered by the ramus. Huh? And then when the entire tooth is in the ramus, that is class three. Huh? Now this is very important uh, because there is a temptation, particularly with vertical tooth, and that's a very common disaster. You would think uh, that it's a very innocent tooth, uh, and then you end up spending seven days trying to extract one tooth. Uh, the, so the, the issue of the ramas is very critical when it comes to assessment of the degree of difficulty. Uh, although, uh, this can also be false because uh, you remember there is what is called the internal oblique ridge and the external oblique ridge. Uh, so the, the ramus is slanting uh, backwards. Uh, so sometimes the ramus is covering the tooth, but yet the tooth is not in the ramus because of the slanting of. Uh, I will illustrate that when we look at the disasters. 101 disasters. And then class, uh, so the Pearl and Gregory does not only apply for verticals, huh? you can also apply it for horizontal. So this will be class one because it's almost at the same occlusal plane, class two between occlusal plane and the cervical margin, and then below the cervical margin, class three, huh? as I said, huh? and the uh, level or position. Uh, uh, so so a very good example is, uh, so the limitation of Pearl and Gregory is, uh, it does not cater for a tooth like this. Huh? So this is a tooth in the, almost nearly in the TMD and ectopically positioned tooth. Huh? So what is interesting about this tip, you will notice uh, if you go back to embryology, huh? there is what is called the gubernaculum cord, huh? which attaches the tooth to the oral mucosa and is thought to, to be a guide to the eruption of a tooth. Huh? So you find it most of the times. Huh? So even a closer look at this image, you see that there is a small radiolucence. And also these teeth, they tend to be associated with a dental follicle 
around her. But again, we are talking about limitations of, of the, the Peo and Grigori classification and the winters uh, with regard to these teeth. And what we are seeing here is a, a, a buccal angular tooth because we are seeing the crown and a bit of, of, of the rooter. Um, so this is an inverted tooth and this is an ectopic tooth below the inferior alveolar nerve. So this one, if, you, if we try to extract it, it's going to be very difficult. Huh? Uh, we'll look at a very interesting disaster that we have come across. Huh? So the other interesting thing about when, in fact, when do we say a tooth is, is mesial angular and which one is horizontal and which one is distal angular? At what angulation are we talking about? So this is another limitation, but it's more of an academic limitation. I don't think we should get into that, but it, it, it looks at, uh, so we say a tooth is vertical. There is an allowance of a deviation of plus or min minus 10 degrees huh, in terms of uh, angulation with reference to the Y axis or the vertical axis, which sometimes is the second molar, but sometimes uh, the second molar is also angulated. So it's not a reliable uh, indicator of the Y axis or the vertical axis. Huh? Mesial angular would be uh, up to uh, between 11 to 70 degrees and so forth and so forth. So this is academic, we will not get into that. And uh, there is also a different classification for, for the maxilla. Uh, so the maxilla is, is very interesting that the, 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 the disimpactions are very easy, but yet if the, if the tooth breaks, it, became, it becomes the, 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 the biggest disaster in third molar surgery. We will look at that. But the classification is also sounds almost like the winter's classification. I will not get into that. But more importantly, for the maxillary teeth, we, we need to look at whether there is a sinus involvement or non sinus involvement. And that is very important. You need to plan for closure of oral antral communication. And this is a tooth in the maxillary. Sinus, huh? and uh, why and when do we extract them? Uh, uh, so there, there are several reasons uh, uh, why we should extract them, uh, but it becomes a bit controversial for, for example, a teenager who presents with a uh, non-symptomatic, uh, a non-symptomatic wisdom tooth. Uh, although we need to define what is a symptomatic wisdom tooth. And what is a non-symptomatic wisdom to that? Um, so uh, the indications are tumors. Uh, but again, a common disaster is if you do an intraoral uh, periapical x-ray for this patient and there is a draining abscess or super infection, yet this patient has a tumor. If you extract, then that is a disaster uh, which we will look at. Uh, infections, Ludwig's angina, severe necrotizing infections, particularly pericoronitis, which can move to the chest. And some patients, particularly those who are immunocompromised, it can be so bad, like this is a very sad story of a lady that I saw at Harare Hospital, we ended up doing a mastectomy because of an impacted wisdom to that. And uh, we, we will discuss, I think, in part two of disasters, uh, how to handle a patient who presents with an infection. So the, the, the temptation is, and the, the old, one of the, uh, the protocols was you prescribe antibiotics, you send the patient home, they come after three days, and then they, they come with Ludwig's angina in the neck, then you prescribe more antibiotics, they come after one week, now it's in the chest, some more antibiotics, now it's in the breast tissue. You, that is a disaster. So in summary, some of the reasons are infections, periodontal disease, 
particularly on the seven pericoronitis, pain, paresthesia, caries, either on the eight or seven, resorption, either internal or external resorption of the seven or the eight, uh, orthodontic uh, considerations for in size, uh, uh, lower in size are crowding. This is a very controversial area which we will discuss under disasters from the masters. Huh? So today, as I said, it's mainly laying a foundation so that we are all in context of uh, what are some of the pitfalls. Uh, I think there's a repetition of root resorption, the trismus, uh, prevention of pathological fractures is thought that the wisdom tooth that is uh, completely impacted, it creates a potential uh, weak point in the, in the jaws. And, and that's why the commonest site for fractures in the mandible would be the, the angle, uh, then teeth in the line of fracture, prophylactic wisdom teeth in the teenagers. Uh, the bone loss, osteomyelitis, tumors, the transplantation. So this is a very interesting area. So if you see a patient with grossly curious sixa, sometimes instead of trying to restore it, sometimes the better option is to wait for two thirds root formation on the wisdom tooth and then come back to it, and then you, you, you extract the, the six and do a transplantation. Huh? So I will present a few cases under disasters from the masters for transplantation of wisdom teeth huh? and what other authors think as well. Uh, contraindications, extremes of age, compromised medical state, excessive risk of damage and so forth. Huh? So, uh, at this stage, uh, uh, so you will notice that third molar surgery is we are discussing disasters from the masters. Huh? We, 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 we will look at uh, prophylactic extractions, uh, predictors of difficulty, ergonomics. Uh, I, I have a colleague, Sejuan, who was telling me that she was nursing uh, a patient with the 60 degrees a uh, benza for two months every day and uh, she ended up with a, with a disc prolapse uh, in the lumbar area uh, because of issues to do with ergonomics and you notice the the incidence of neck problems among dentists it's it's, it's, it's very high it's something that will look at what is the best position when you are doing wisdom teeth the room setup aseptic technique uh, local anesthesia, flap designs, the various controversies, and the flaps that can be very disastrous. Huh? And uh, the osteotomy, uh, are we using high speed, uh, slow speed, what disasters can occur, tooth sectioning, and so forth, and so forth. Huh? So all these are disasters, they can occur uh, as complications, for example, inferior of your nerve damage, lingual or inferior of viola, and what I usually call the anaconda, uh, which is the greater palatina, uh, oral antral communication, the root either in the sinus, sometimes the root in the inferior of viola canal, uh, or the root lingually displaced uh, or displaced to the pterygoid plate, or the patient who suddenly is bleeding, whilst you are, so that will be part two, uh, uh, but I, I must mention the disasters uh, at this stage so that we can go and research and learn more about the bleeding patient, either intra-op or post-op, uh, or the patient who swallows or aspirates a tooth and how to avoid that. Uh, so this might sound dramatic, but I think I have seen three patients uh, with this complication. Uh, Coronectomy, is it a treatment? What are the indications? Uh, when do you do orthodontic extrusion of the wisdom tooth in preparation or in trying to avoid uh, inferior of yellow nerve and some post-operative issue? What do you do with penicillin allergies and how do they present uh, edema 
Is it a complication? How do we manage? How do we assess uh, post-operative instructions? This is, to me, is one of the biggest disasters from the masters. And when we do that molar surgery, uh, I wish if one of these days we would come up with a panel discussion to, to, to discuss different, tapping into different opinion, particularly from our senior colleagues. And when it comes to things to do with the diet, uh, alveolar osteitis, things to do with fractured mandible, uh, these are all disasters. Look, so look at this, uh, the unknown supernumerary uh, to the, the, the tired practitioner, uh, the cost of wisdom teeth. So we'll look at all this at some point during the course of the, of the year and beware of the athletic African men in their forties. Huh? And uh, you think we are doing a simple upper age. Huh? Uh, and when to say this patient is GA, uh, uh, the severely anxious patient, do we start, do we do sedation? Are we allowed to do sedation in Zimbabwe? If you want to do sedation, how do you do that? Uh, do we do restorations on third molars, trismus, uh, pre-op, uh, all these things and so forth? Look at that. It's a very long list. Huh? Uh, do we do all four wisdom teeth? Uh, uh, the broken tuberosity, uh, wisdom teeth, the epileptic patient, uh, all these are disasters. Huh? I saw a, a hypertensive patient uh, sometime last week. We had BPs of 150 over 90, uh, severe pain. Uh, there was a controversy of what is a high, uh, what is high blood pressure? When do we extract? And if we extract, what disasters you can okay from the masters, the asthmatic patient? do we always need to do x-rays and soft tissue injuries? Huh? Um, so the wisdom, third molar surgery uh, is made easier if we have the correct instruments and the correct armamentary man. So on one side, you see, uh, you know, I, I will never forget uh, an experience I was called in by a, a colleague to do a wisdom tooth halfway during the procedure. And uh, what I realized that the difficult, sometimes the difficulty or the disaster is not in the skill, but it's in the availability of correct instruments to, to perform the procedure. Obviously, if you are given a fork and knife, you, you, you will not be able to extract no matter how much training or skill sets that you have. Huh? So you can do, you need rotary instruments, either high speed turbine or slow speed straight. There are also some different angulations for this slow speed. Or you can sometimes, you can use a mallet and then osteotome or cheesy one. Uh, although we have gradually moved away from, from the, the use of, of, of such instruments, huh? you, you need your, so the, the, the row below is some of the basic instruments. So look at that, there are many uh, scissors, need to hold a cryer or east and wet elevator, coupland or direct uh, elevator. So they, Normally, it's good to have different sizes. So they size one up, size four. And there's a very beautiful elevator there, which is known as the Warwick Gems. So they are tiny elevators, uh, excellent, particularly when you leave some roots there. There is also a curate to remove your dental follicle, uh, your periosteal elevators, your, your bud packer in a blade holder and size 15 blade uh, retractors for the flapper. So this retractor, which is 90 degree angled, is very nice. So this is called uh, the Langenberg retractor. Langenberg retractor. They come in different sizes. Huh? So the longer ones are very good if you are doing upper wisdom teeth. Huh? And the shorter ones for lower wisdom teeth. This is a, 
a caved mosquito artery forcep for bleeding. E, suture, the best size is normally a 3O, e, absorbable, although you can use silk. E, this is a malleable, particularly if the tooth is displaced lingual, it's called a malleable retractor for the tongue or the tongue flapper. E, caved apical elevator for root tips. There are specific instruments like what you are seeing there and your forceps. Huh? Some patients have trismus, huh? so you can use some of these mouth, mouth props. Huh? To, so when you anesthetize, if you use this, it will sort of increase the, the baseline mouth opening. Huh? Although for patients who have a tendency to get tired huh, during the procedure, your mouth it will be a game changer. You could use sterile gloves or clean gloves. Huh? Uh, which one do we use? We'll discuss that shortly. Uh, so what do we do with an 18 year old uh, with asymptomatic wisdom teeth? Uh, like for example, you, you look at this teeth, uh, root formation, two thirds, uh, the upper ones are impacted. Huh? Is it going to erupt? Is it not going to erupt? Do we extract? Uh, so there, there, there are certain, there are people who argue for a blanket moratorium or they believe that all impacted wisdom teeth should be extracted. Huh? And should we extract, is it a disaster? Is it not a disaster? And their argument is uh, issues to do with periodontal disease particularly distal to the seven huh, or the second molar. Uh, we know that in, uh, there is loss of distal bone most of the times huh, and uh, increased pocket depth. Huh. And the other argument is the cost of monitoring over the years because most of these patients, you every year you have to do a wisdom tooth evaluation the cost of maintenance on the side of the patient, dental flossing, bed breath, uh, the difficulty. So these are people who argue for uh, the difficulty of the procedure as we advance in age. We know that these wisdom teeth are very easy to remove for patients below the age of 25. Huh? And the post-operative recovery is quick, less complications. Uh, we know that the second molar carries uh, increases, we tend to have caries anywhere there. So the, the NICE guidelines, huh, which is uh, some board in the UK and the, the AFA guideline, which is some board in, in, in the US, huh, around 2000, because the surgeons had become obsessed with pulling out all wisdom teeth, they, they realized that there was no need. So they say that there is no need to to extract asymptomatic wisdom teeth. But what we have observed that there has been an increase from 4% to 19% in the incidence of caries on the distal uh, seven and also on the eight. So that's why some people argue for and the crowding uh, of the lower anteriors. Uh, and for patients undergoing orthognathic, we know routinely we have to take out the wisdom tooth because the line of the osteotomy, osteotome or the cut is somewhere around the, the wisdom tooth. Huh? The prosthetic or restopurposes huh? prior to radiation, resorption, all these are people who argue for all these tumors. Huh? And some people also argue that less than 2% of wisdom teeth are free of of periodontal disease or caries by the age of 65. Huh? And some, so some studies, huh? so I'm going to illustrate about five studies. Huh? So there are several studies that have found that between 30 to 60% of people with previously asymptomatic impacted wisdom teeth who have them extracted huh? uh, four to 12 years after initial examination. Huh? issues to do with the occlusal interference, cheek biting, mastication disorder, TMJ problems from the wisdom teeth. And this is a, a very interesting study. We know that uh, patients with this marker 
so Dr. Chikosi, the pathologist, will tell us that if you see KI67 and P53 mutations, uh, the patient is at a higher risk of, a very high risk of squamous cell carcinoma. And what has been observed is the dental follicles uh, of smokers, uh, a very high uh, expression of KI67 and P53. Uh, and uh, we think that the high incidence of retromolar squamous cell carcinoma in smokers would then be an argument for a blanket moratorium of extracting wisdom teeth. Uh. So patients with cysts, for example, this is a huge cyst because of an so this is a dentigerous cyst because of an impacted wisdom tooth or patients with large tumors like what you are seeing. So instead of pulling out one wisdom tooth, uh, some people would argue if you leave it alone, you would end up pulling out the, the whole jaw. Although uh, there are a lot of arguments against, you will see that my list is very short. It's not because of a, of a bias. Uh, but uh, uh, I tend to be more inclined to, 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 to extracting the wisdom teeth. Uh, I will give a small conclusion uh, with regard to this controversy shortly. But people who argue against, they think that the, the complications, for example, fracture of the jaws, damage to to, to inferior alveolar nerve, which can which is can be a permanent and devastating uh, complication, issues to do with cost. Uh, if you do a survey, the average cost of a wisdom tooth is, is I think it's it's very high in in, in my opinion, uh, although I don't mind the high cost. Uh, uh, traumatic uh, experience of the procedure uh, can leave. Uh, even issues to do with, uh, okay, I will talk about it shortly. And uh, uh, Richardson and Dodson, uh, one of the things that they said is indications for third molar extraction should be evaluated carefully in individuals with a healthy periodontium in the region of the second molar. Since this procedure heightens the risk of greater probing depth and attachment loss, huh? The extraction of the lower third molars could lead to a periodontal defect in the distal region of the second molar. So they think if you go dig that asymptomatic tooth, you are increasing the pocket depth. Uh, but there is a very huge study where people looked at surgical removal versus retention for management of asymptomatic or disease-free impacted wisdom tooth. And, uh, they looked at several things. One of the things that they were discussing uh, is, uh, do we really, uh, do we really get anterior crowding uh, with wisdom teeth? Uh? So they did a study on adolescents uh, where they they tried to. So the adolescents we had uh, we had braces uh, and they compared the ones we had removal of wisdom teeth versus the ones that had no removal. Their conclusion was that there is not enough evidence to support either the routine removal or retention of impacted wisdom teeth. And uh, another randomized control trial study in the UK, uh, what their conclusion was it's not reasonable to remove asymptomatic uh, disease-free impacted wisdom teeth merely because you want to prevent incisor crowding as there is not enough strong evidence to show association. And this, a cross-sectional study performed by in the, in the US and Finland, they also argued that most of the wisdom teeth, uh, they eventually get removed uh, uh, over a lifetime. Uh, and that up to 80% of the surviving wisdom teeth you have some form of pathology, mainly caries. Huh? And the evidence from these cross-sectional studies is, however, we need to take it with a pinch of salt huh? because these guys are arguing that uh, we, everyone eventually, I mean, 80%, that's a huge percentage, you will get some form of pathology. Huh? 
uh, it's unreliable and the studies assessing the outcomes of retained wisdom teeth are rare because of problems associated with a complex long-term prospective study design. So you would need actually to put patients into two categories. Huh? You, the ones that you remove, you follow up, and then the ones that which is almost impossible. And uh, some people have tried to follow up patients for, for about six years, huh? like White et al. And they found that the, the, the severity of the initial periodontal disease was significantly increased at the site of young adults with the present uh, disease of uh, more than uh, four millimeter pocket depth. Uh, so Fisher et al. He looked at 262 participants uh, over uh, two years and he concluded that routine dental prophylaxis in patients uh, uh, is no impact on, on the periodontal uh, pocket depth. Uh. So basically, we, they ended up developing a protocol, their own protocol, where they said if you do a, a pocket depth analysis behind the seven, if it is above five millimeter, then it's wiser to extract. Uh. But let me not get lost in this argument as I conclude this argument. But you notice that recently the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, they now lean towards the removal of asymptomatic third molars on the basis that they are associated with increased periodontal pocket depth and are therefore a, pot a potential source of chronic disease. And also more recently, people are going against the NICE guidelines huh? because they say based on the risk of developing pathology on the wisdom teeth in future, the and also the risk of complications, if you do the wisdom tooth in an adult, huh? like in their 40s, huh? the conclusion is asymptomatic removal is advised. Huh? So in conclusion, given the current lack of consensus huh, and the available evidence, the patient value should be considered if you want to make a decision whether to remove wisdom teeth in an 18 year old. Huh? And you also have to look at the clinical expertise huh, to guide in decision making uh, when it comes to asymptomatic teeth. Huh? And if the decision is made to retain these teeth clinical assessment at regular intervals to prevent undesirable outcomes like tumors is very advisable. However, a well-designed randomized control trial investigating the long-term and rare effects of retention versus removal of asymptomatic disease-free impacted teeth is very important. And uh, it, in the coming five minutes, as we come to a conclusion, we'll look at uh, what is a difficult wisdom tooth uh, and what are the predictors, which wisdom tooth is straightforward. Uh, so obviously this is a very difficult wisdom tooth, uh, even the tariff code. So what you are seeing is a, it's an X-ray of the pelvis. Uh, uh, this is actually the sacroiliac joint uh, and uh, these are ectopic wisdom teeth. Uh, some people would call it a teratoma. And uh, this is after the disimpaction. Uh, I don't know whether to call it a hysterectomy or disimpaction of multiple wisdom teeth. Uh, so, so the predictor would be the location, the depth. So this will be very deep down there. Uh, yet we work high up there on the other end of the GIT. So Pedersen scale uh, in 1988 is, is a very beautiful scale, which helps us to assess uh, uh, the difficulty. So he, he thinks that uh, the winter's classification, so if a tooth is mesial angular, you score one, horizontal, you score two, vertical, you score three, distal angular, you score four, depth uh, also, and also the class, which is the relationship with the ramasa. And then you combine the score 
So what is very interesting is the easiest wisdom tooth would then be a mesioangular tooth uh, on the same occlusal uh, on the same occlusal plane with the second molar, which is not covered by the ramas of the mandibula. A difficult would be look at where vertical is. Huh? Uh, and that's the one that we always think is the easiest. Huh? So the vertical, uh, which is very deep, would be uh, very difficult. Huh? Uh, there are other uh, predictors, for example, what are called the wall lines. Huh? So the, the wall lines, there are actually three lines, uh, the white line, which is the relationship to the occlusal plane, the amber and the red line. So this is more like an acronomy, white, amber, and red. So red is an imaginary line, which is perpendicular to the white line, which goes down to the CEJ. So it's assumed that's where you are going to apply your elevator. So the deeper that line is from the bone, the more difficult. Huh? So we say when it is more than five millimeter, the extraction is difficult. Huh? And every additional increase in one millimeter, it means the tooth is three times more likely to be difficult. Huh? And uh, there is also what is called the Waffe index, huh? which uh, can help us as clinicians also. The good thing about the Waffe index, it also looks at the actual degree of angulation, the actual depth in millimeter, and the size of the follicle. But in, 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 in our experience, uh, we have noticed that there are other predictors like age. Uh, for me, age is, is, is very critical. Uh, anxiety factor, sometimes the tooth is very easy and the patient is, is very anxious, uh, jumping all over the place. Uh. A geographic a location where the patient is coming from and the race, there is a difference among different races. The, the, the African patient coming from, from our rural communities, and you notice sometimes for whatever reason, it's, it's more difficult than most of our patients coming from the urban community, proximity to nerve, all these things, issues to do with uh, adjacent restorations and trying to extract a tooth where there is an implant or a restoration instruments. Instruments is, is, is a predictor of, of difficulty. Uh, you would need a full set, as I said. Uh, you would, so it's, it's, it's very important. So the image that you are seeing is, uh, uh, whereas it's very good to invest in, in what you are seeing in this image. Uh, so this is a, a residential stand for 110,000 US dollars in Glen Lona. As we do this, uh, we must not forget to invest in one of the key predictors of whether a wisdom tooth is going to be difficult for you. Uh, this might save your day. Uh, even the competence of your assistants, the experience, the training, and so forth, and so forth. Uh, since we said there are several parts to this discussion, I will, I will stop here for now and hand over to Dr. Fiki. Thank you, Doc. Um, that was a great lecture. Very informative. I'm sure everyone is looking forward to the upcoming lectures. Do we have any questions? If anyone has a question, um, you can either put it in the chat or you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Are there any questions? Hello. Yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Evidence Yamazawa. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Manana for the wonderful presentation. 
and I could not resist to comment given that he kept on coming up with issues to do with uh, evidence, especially the nice guidelines that he has mentioned. And uh, yeah, I would like to concur with him, uh, their arguments for and against some of the issues uh, with regards to the management of impacted molars. But I would like to also, I think uh, maybe shed a bit more light on it. It was nice is, is, um, is a clinical guidelines uh, agents for the UK. And as such, they, they base their guidance on what they call health technology assessments. And these health technology assessments are basically the synthesis of uh, evidence to come up with guidelines. And uh, this evidence is in the area of clinical effectiveness, safety issues, ethical issues, legal issues, social issues, economic issues. And uh, they normally take the perspective of the national health services given how the health, public health system in the UK is funded. So it is wise, like uh, uh, Dr. Manana has said, to, to, to bring these uh, types of evidence to the local context and to especially be mindful of uh, patient values when we are deciding uh, on what to do or giving out information. So I would also want to encourage him uh, as an expert in this area to also come up with the guidelines uh, to maybe help us in decision making. Because um, like he has appropriately said, I think uh, we, we might not have enough primary evidence to come up with our own uh, guidelines because you need primary evidence to synthesize secondary evidence, which is then uh, the best for your recommendations. But I believe we still have experts in this area, uh, including him. So I think uh, they can also give their expert opinion. That is still evidence. It might not be at the level at which you want it to be, but uh, we will be starting off from somewhere. So yes, I think there is room for us to, 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 to adapt this evidence to local context, and we should do that. So once again, I thank you, uh, Dr. Manana. It's more of a comment uh, rather than a question. I'm looking forward to the uh, following presentations. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nyamazao, for a very detailed uh, clarification. And I, I concur with you that there is a very wide research gap in terms of several guidelines when it comes to third molar surgery. And uh, I would like to take it upon, especially our institutions of higher learning, particularly the University of Zimbabwe. These are some of the things that we we think we should consider looking at uh, in the short term. Uh, once again, thank you for the comment. Uh. Thank you for that comment, Dr. Nyamadzai. Is there anyone with a question? Anyone else with a question? Uh, if there's no one with a question, whilst we wait, maybe people are still thinking. Dr. Kunzekwe Guta, are you there? Dr. Kunze wanted to say, say something. Yes, Dr. Vicky. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manana, for the detailed presentation. Uh, I have an announcement to make. SDZ, the Executive Council, through the Strategic Review Committee, uh, we're in the process of formulating the ZIDA strategic plan covering 2021 to 2023. So in order to get member input in this process, we are going to send out a questionnaire uh, that is tomorrow through the monkey survey platform. And uh, the strategy review survey is designed to capture your thoughts on the strategic issues affecting the Zimbabwe Dental Association. Uh, the results of this survey will help guide the strategic committee to create a long-term plan to steer the association in a direction that benefits members of the association. Your participation is voluntary and your identity will remain anonymous, meaning that your responses cannot be connected with you. Your views are however important and will be really beneficial to this exercise. So the link for the survey is going to be sent out tomorrow and we are encouraging every member of the association to take part uh, was this is our plan and we would want everyone's input. Uh, we would want to make ZIDA great as our association. Thank you, Dr. Vicky, back to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Kunze for the announcement. I'm sure everyone heard that. 
So members, if there are no further questions, I think we can close the meeting for today. We can't wait for the follow-up, uh, which will be in a few weeks. We'll be updating you on that. So thank you, Dr. Manana, that was excellent. Um, I think we can call it an evening. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Good night to everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.